And we now move to the next topic, uh, which is about mapping rewilding opportunities in Europe. And for that, I would like to introduce and invite Raquel Figueras, Head of Rewilding um, at Rewilding Europe, so to chair this session. So welcome, Raquel. Thank you, Frank. This session speaks about potential, potential of rewilding. And rewilding happens every time that the, the use of the land changes and you let nature play out and uh, the natural processes that, uh, that happened. There's a famous example of that uh, at the, in the Nappy State in the United Kingdom, uh, where this process is happening in a, in a, in a, in a private property. Um, this is a pioneering project that has seen incredible results so far. Um, and Isabella Tree, uh, one of the owners of the estate, has recently wrote a book about that same journey of transformation called Wilding, and where she explains how, how did this transformation happen from a, a farm that has been uh, heavily degraded uh, along the years to an amazing uh, landscape uh, that is now rewilded, or in the process of getting rewilded. Um, we will now watch a short movie on, on that uh, transformation. It is a movie that uh, has been is, is, is told by her husband, Charlie Burrell, and uh, he's the owner of the, the estate, uh, and so enjoy it. We know that there's maybe 60 years of harvest left on the planet in the conventional farming systems. Could we look at something else? Could we look at some way of looking at this landscape in a different way? Something that we could you know, enhance it and feel proud about it. What about making it wild again? Isn't that exciting? The sort of land we're on is very heavy clay. It's the soil that is very, very difficult to farm commercially. Out of the 17 years that I was farming the land conventionally, we did make a couple of years profit. But you're using fungicides, you're using herbicides, you're using pesticides on the land, and your soil is dead. It's just dirt. Once we were going from conventional farming to the rewilded landscape, where you're a bit nervous about how you're going to make your money, how it's going to work, but there is no inputs, there's no, there's no grain, there is nothing being bought in, so the cost of production just drops away. I know that the production isn't huge, but it's what the land can sustain. It's what uh, is able to, to live all year round without any supplementary feeding. And you've got these once domesticated animals now becoming more and more in tune with the landscape and living off that landscape without human intervention. The longhorn cattle are the, the Exmoor ponies, and then you've got your deer and your Tamworth pigs. When you've got all these animals running around in this sort of landscape, it begins to feel like scrubland in Africa. So when you see your longhorn, it doesn't look like a domesticated animal anymore because what your mind is saying, there is an animal in scrubland and it's wild. When you go out at dawn, you can feel your chest vibrating with the sheer volume of noise. I had never experienced any of that. That was the big difference. It was that noise level, that, that vibrant noise created by all these, this life that I had absolutely no idea my land could feel and behave like that.
it's been this huge wave of interest. Everyone wants to feel that it's possible to do something. And if you've got a real hope story that you can transform an agricultural desert into something which is very rich and biodiverse, it becomes all possible and something that you can do. We're on a crest of a wave and it's all beginning to feel like it's got a real momentum behind it. So, in this uh, short movie that you just watched, uh, you could see that there's great potential for rewilding, uh, even in private estates like NEP. And based on that, I would like to ask you our uh, polling question once again, um, to hear your thoughts on, on rewilding in these types of uh, land uses and these types of estates. In this short movie, um, you saw what happened in, in CNEP. So the question that I have for you is um, rewilding on a former piece of intensively used farmland. Is there room for more land used according to these ideas? So let us know your thoughts and vote now uh, on the app. Um, and then we'll come back to the polling, uh, polling results once the presentation is over. This session speaks about potential, as I mentioned. And uh, the question is, where can we find areas in Europe where this potential can be realized? Europe is a big continent, uh, but there are great potential out there. Our next speaker is uh, Nesta Fernandes, who is a conservation biologist at the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research in Leipzig, Germany. And Nesta uses uh, remote sensing and modeling to understand and map land use change across the continent. And based on that, identify areas that could have the potential for future rewilding. Um, I'm going to give the floor to Nestor just now, but before I do, remember, you can ask questions in the question and answer section of the app. So go ahead. We've been getting great questions. So please let us know as, you, as we go along. And uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, give the floor to Nestor. Thank you, Raquel. It's a great pleasure to be here and trying to explain a little bit of uh, my research. In recent years, trying to support uh, rewilding action uh, through modeling. So um, I'm going to present mostly the results of a project that we have been doing together with several NGOs uh, and very closely with Rewilding Europe, where we um, studied the distribution of the ecological integrity in Europe and how using that information can provide uh, better ideas of uh, where it is critical to uh, implement restoration actions guided by the principles of rewilding. But I would like to start with this slide. Um, biodiversity is declining globally. This is no surprise for any of our audience. Uh, the Living Planet report that appeared uh, for 2020 a few weeks ago um, showed, showed a very um, uh, important uh, result, uh, which is that more than 68% of the abundance of uh, populations in natural ecosystems have been declining over the, the last uh, uh, 40 years or 50 years. But one important thing to realize about this is that those declines are not random. So those declines uh, affect especially to some specific species. Declines are being mostly observed in what we call the megafauna, that is the large body species. And here to the right, you can see a wonderful work uh, by Rodolfo Dirson colleagues from a few years ago, where they showed that the extinctions that happened in the past and the extinctions that are happening now and the population declines that we are observing uh, have affected in much higher way, in, much, in a much higher uh, level to large body species. And it is important to realize that those uh, declines not only put in danger to the species themselves, but also to the ecological processes in which those species are involved. For example, declines in large herbivore, uh, large carnivore animals like the Avian lynx here to the top left, one of my favorite animals, uh, have cascading effects and can affect other species through their control of, um, of the prey populations, which in turn also regulate vegetation dynamics, for example. And this has been shown 
in very convincing studies uh, for many uh, carnivore species. Large herbivores, when they are at uh, high enough quantities or densities, may be able to regulate the vegetation heterogeneity of the landscape, opening, for example, patches that are habitats for more species. Scavengers, uh, Franz were, was speaking about the importance of scavengers uh, before. Um, this is something uh, really important in conservation now. Uh, they are on the focus of uh, many conservation initiatives because among other things, they provide critical sanitary services. For example, vultures. Vultures alone in Spain can remove up to 25,000 tons of carcass every year. And this is all in Spain. Just imagine uh, the service they are providing in, in uh, terms of health, but also in terms of economy. And finally, recent work also shows that megafauna can have very important roles in dispersing uh, seeds of animals. So that is uh, uh, ecological processes where they were not suspected to be involved uh, only a few years and recent research is showing. But uh, uh, the ecological impacts uh, by humans do not only affect the species in the sense of declining their populations, they also affect important ecosystem functions. For example, the sign drivers of extinction that affect the decline of large carnivores and large herbivores also affect uh, functions underpin underpinned by, uh, for example, the soil biodiversity or the biodiversity of smaller plants and smaller animals and so on. Here I show a slide um, where we see that uh, the distance to the near infrastructure in Europe. So you go to any point in Europe and the distance to the near, nearest infrastructure um, is on average 1.5 kilometers. So this is really short. It means that the European landscape is dominated by roads, is dominated by fragmentation. And there is another very important component of the impact of humans on ecosystems. And it is that we remove a lot of the primary productivity of the system. So a lot of uh, the biomass, a lot of the biological uh, products that ecosystems uh, deliver is removed by humans. So more than 40% of the potential animal productivity in Europe is appropriated by us. And this is um, mostly due to agricultural areas, but not only high amounts of uh, grass uh, productivity, grassland productivity, high amounts of forest productivity is also appropriated. Now, those uh, effects, the declines, the appropriation of primary productivity, the fragmentation affect ecosystems all across Europe. There is no single ecosystem type that is affected uh, by those activities. And now the European Union is addressing this problem with a potentially very powerful tool, which is reflected in biodiversity strategy of the European Commission. And it is a mandate to restore degraded ecosystems and to stop any further damage to, to nature. And this is a very important hook that uh, we really need to, to grab in order to promote restoration, but mostly to promote functional restoration of the landscapes. And this is what we call in principles to promote. Uh, last year, we published a paper where we defined, together with many um, different uh, authors from different institutions in Europe, what we think that the Arguelin strategy should address. And um, I would like to summarize um, what is this Arguelin strategy? How, how can we restore ecosystems based on rewilding? And this is summarized in this figure. So there are like three main components. Uh, that we need to address. And those components are important because uh, they promote the self-sustainability of ecosystems and the resilience of ecosystems. And those components that we identified are, are first of all, the trophic complexity, which involves, as I was saying before, uh, maintaining the ecological functions, all the interactions uh, between the species and with a special emphasis on large bodied species, a second component is to maintain, to maintain and increase the connectivity of ecosystems, for example, affected by fragmentation, but also by, by other human uses. Um, and finally, to allow for stochastic ecosystem disturbances to happen, that is to allow natural processes to occur naturally without the human influence. In the center of this triangle is the red state where many ecosystems in, in Europe are now and all over the world. Uh, which is a highly constrained functioning of the ecosystems, uh, but 
also there are many opportunities. So there are some uh, relaxations of the pressures on those ecosystems that now expand the opportunity to recover some of those uh, degraded structural components and functional components um, of nature. So, uh, of course, there is a lot of dispersal limiting infrastructure out there, but there are actions that can be done on, on those infrastructures to increase connectivity, for example, through removing dams uh, that are um, affecting the connectivity of European rivers. Um, there are, for example, conflicts uh, between humans and wildlife, but those conflicts are being relaxed in many areas of Europe. There is a lot of work on, on coexistence, and that work in interaction with all, their, all the other components allow to increase the traffic complexity of the systems. And uh, of course, there are some environmental risks that limit the natural function and affect the systems. But uh, through rewilding, through some actions, like for example, allowing for natural reflowing um, of, um, of the river um, sites. Um, so we can actually address some of those uh, risks. And many of those actions actually have important contributions to people. So there are no material regulation, regulating and material contributions that are positive for people living in those environments. Now, how do we go from this theoretical and very uh, solid concept from, from a scientific point of view to uh, inform policies in relation to where we should restore, where we should, should rewild, and what are the benefits of that? This is uh, something at work we, we are addressing now. We have been addressing last year, and we continue addressing uh, with three main questions uh, in mind. First of all, is uh, to try to find out how to reverse the defaunation and the fragmentation of ecosystems. And for that, it is important to understand what is the current ecological status of those ecosystems. Second is to acknowledge that natural system dynamics uh, is a main restoration goal. It's an important restoration goal. Without large scale restoration, uh, restoration will not have important impacts on ecosystem dynamics. And finally, we need to recognize that there are opportunities for passive restoration processes that we need to grab. To support those uh, conservation policies, we addressed assessments at the European scale on uh, each of those three components of the rewilding triangle. And starting with the first one is uh, we could ask the question of what is the status of uh, European landscapes in terms of the complexity of uh, trophic uh, interactions. This first component, um, we addressed uh, mapping of this component and assessing uh, the distribution of uh, populations and the diversity of uh, megafauna in Europe through uh, collecting information on past distributions of uh, the megafauna, evaluating how those past distributions were related to environmental conditions, and then comparing uh, one situation in which uh, species would be distributed in Europe without uh, the effects, the constraints imposed by humans uh, in relation to where the species are uh, distributed now. So for doing this work, uh, we collected a big database of um, distributions of large carnivores and herbivores. Uh, some of that data um, we have to drag into many different publications and many different sources because very often that data is hidden in, in, in uh, different sources and, and it's not easy to uh, use um, directly this kind of assessment. But we wanted to go beyond um, assessing whether one species was present in one place in relation to where it was or not. And we also calculated like what is the functional diversity that those uh, megafauna species provide. And with functional diversity, I mean the unique functions that uh, each of those species uh, actually provide. And we, for that, we designed an indicator of functional diversity for European landscapes, uh, which is what is uh, shown in this map. And one of the things that we found is that only about 5% of the area covered by the European Union preserves of or has uh, recovered half or more of the baseline, baseline functional diversity um, of, uh, of megafauna. And there is no single place in Europe 
that preserves the full functional diversity that one could observe uh, several millennia ago. The second component is about how do we reconnect European landscapes? That is how we connect landscapes that allow for dispersal. And for addressing this component, um, we estimated to what degree the components, uh, the, the landscapes in Europe are fragmented by infrastructures that I was uh, uh, explaining before, which are, which importance is enormous in determining many uh, ecosystem functions, but also on, we included in this uh, assessment, the impacts of intensive agriculture. So we have been developing uh, different assessments at the European scale about how combining uh, infrastructures with intensive agriculture actually reduce um, the functions or, or the, the availability of nature uh, for ecosystems and their functions. So just as an example, uh, uh, landscapes in Europe are, are fragment, fragmented to a great extent. The Natura 2000 network is able to somehow compensate for that kind of fragmentation a little bit, or at least they are distributed in less fragmented areas. But uh, about 70% of the landscape uh, patches that we identified all over Europe presented a high degree of fragmentation. And finally, the third component of this rewilding triangle is about ecosystem dynamics and disturbances. Um, so uh, this is a, a particularly different, difficult component to map. So how humans have been uh, impacting um, the natural disturbance and the natural functioning of ecosystems. And we decided to go in one direction, which is uh, using this indicator of the human application of primary productivity. So what we did together with um, Christoph Plutzer and some other colleagues at Boku in, uh, in, the, in Vienna was to map uh, the amount of appropriation of primary productivity by humans in forests and in grassland areas. And here, I am showing the left um, maps. So to the left, it is the forestry impacts of humans. And uh, in red, it is areas highly affected uh, by human extractions. And in green are those areas that are less affected. And we can see big clusters of high uh, forestry impacts in Europe, like for example, in Scandinavian countries, but also in many areas of Central Europe. And to the right, in the right map, uh, we have the grazing impacts um, so it's a similar estimation of uh, the proportion of primary productivity that is removed by humans, but this time it's in grasslands. And uh, we can see that, for example, it is less important in Mediterranean areas, but extremely important in Atlantic areas. So just summarizing these uh, two slides, these two maps, around 20% of European grasslands and European forests preserve medium to low levels of harvest, that is, levels of harvest where humans appropriate uh, less than 10% of the primary productivity. Now, how do we go about putting all the, this information together and uh, building maps of ecological integrity that can help us to understand the status of European landscapes and uh, can help us also to identify priority areas for restoration? So what we did was to exactly that, combine those um, those different uh, elements of rewilding into one single indicator that we, we call the uh, ecological integrity indicator. And uh, this indicator basically shows uh, areas uh, which are, well, the areas that have a high integrity are those that, for example, are landscapes, large landscapes in terms of um, um, connectivity. So those are landscapes with low fragmentation. Those large landscapes, in addition, have low levels of human appropriation of uh, primary productivity in forests or in grasslands. And in addition to that, those landscapes preserve a high proportion of the functional diversity of megafauna. While in the opposite side, in the reds, could be highly fragmented areas with high um, appropriation by humans of the primary productivity and with no or very low megafauna. Uh, remaining. This uh, map reflects the extent to which the foundation, fragmentation of the landscape, and the uh, continued extraction of the natural resources 
have altered the natural state of ecosystems, but it also provides useful information to identify suitable conditions uh, of cells sustained nature. So we think that this is a very important tool to support restoration action and specifically in the, in the context of the European policies and the, the new um, biodiversity strategy of the European Union where restoration is a, a key component. From this map, we can find, for example, where are those areas with higher integrity in terms of, um, uh, of those rewarding components? And this is a map showing the 5% highest integrity areas per country. So this is stratified, this is dividing um, each piece of land by country, and then identifying within each of those countries where are the most integral areas in terms of the, those ecological processes we are considering. But we can go beyond, we can go farther and we can ask, okay, so according to the um, ecological integrity of the landscapes in Europe, how do we go to connect better the Natura 2000 network? So Natura 2000 is the backbone of, um, of the conservation uh, policies in Europe, right? That, that's, that's something um, which is key to consider when, when also uh, planning for restoration and rewilding. So how can we increase the cohesion of that Natural 2000 network? Where should the corridors be distributed? And uh, here in the left map, um, I'm showing one of the, those analyses we have been doing uh, for trying to find like the main corridors, the priority corridors that need to uh, be uh, restored or preserved in order to have a better co connectivity of the Natural 2000 network. In the map of the right, uh, I'm selecting a subset of those corridors, and those are the ones that are especially important because if uh, the landscape uh, across those corridors is degraded, it will have a very strong impact on the connectivity of uh, natural 2000 landscapes. And uh, uh, similarly, if those landscapes are restored, the connectivity of the natural 2000 network will be improved. And uh, by this means, we identified more than 1,000 kilometers of corridors as priority pathways to restore the cohesion of the Natural 2000 network. Now, those, those uh, pieces of information can be used in many different ways. This is only one illustration of another uh, nice way, I would say, that, that uh, um, can be where, with which this information can be used. And it is, for example, ranking uh, cities in Europe in terms of how uh, is the ecological integrity of the landscapes in the surrounding. And we ranked the European cities, the European capitals um, of the EU 27 countries according to this indicator. So this, this is, uh, what is, where is nature close to people of higher quality across the European cities and then uh, one can see uh, easily that if you want to plan your um, next holidays uh, when the COVID situation allows for it, you can visit Ljubljana and also don't forget to visit the, the surroundings because it is there where you will find the highest ecological integrity in terms of connectivity, traffic complexity and, and uh, stochastic disturbances. Yeah? While if you go to Brussels, you will have um, a hard time and you will have to travel a little bit more outside the city to find those areas. So um, this is uh, a lot about uh, big scale, European continental scale assessments of connectivity of the status of ecosystems. But it is important also to be able to develop uh, similar approaches that are able to inform at the local scale in specific areas where restoration, rewilding projects are occurring, what is the progress of, um, of those um, of those projects. Yeah? So how are landscapes changing locally? And um, one thing that I really want, one message I really want to deliver is that we need to develop uh, approaches that are scalable. That means the same approach is used for the big maps at the European scale as for assessing changes at the local scale. And this slide shows uh, what we call the rewilding score. It is a, a way of evaluating progress in, in rewilding according to the three main components of rewilding and, uh, and an assessment of this rewilding score in some areas um, 
in this case of the Rewalde Europe network, and you can see that some of the of those areas are having some progress. So, for example, in the Central Apennines, or in the Danube Be uh, Delta, or in the Carpathian, where either the ecological integrity uh, is increasing, or human forcing on the systems are decreasing, or both are um, progressing in, in a positive way. But also, in some areas, uh, one of those uh, axes might be um, having a good progress. But uh, at the same time, there are other pressures um, around those areas that, uh, that are uh, counteracting the positive uh, effects of management. Like, for example, in the Rodope Mountains, where the uh, CAP policies are um, um, motivating that a lot of the traditional agricultural lands are transformed into intensively used lands, uh, which is uh, kind of uh, degrading the landscape despite the strong efforts for trying to increase the rewarding score. This is a, a work that we are continuing doing in the, in the context of um, a thesis of uh, Josian Seeger together with, uh, in collaboration with Rural in Europe. And this, there is another important piece of research that we need to advance, and it is about informing on where uh, Rural in Action will have a more important impact uh, locally. And this is about including people in designing those futures for the local landscapes. Uh, this slide uh, to the right uh, presents uh, work that Laura Quintero is doing also in our, in our lab, um, where she's uh, starting to develop participatory scenarios to support um, the design of the in action. And there is something, we started this work by you know, reading and checking uh, what the literature uh, says about participatory scenarios for restoration, we found that many participatory scenarios that have been developed in Europe have focused intensively on the natural contributions to people. So that is regulatory services, material services, and so on. But very few have focused on very important aspects of ecological restoration and the wilding, like, like for example, uh, restoring large body species, restoring natural disturbances, some of them uh, have focused on, on the connectivity, but none of them have considered together all those three components that uh, uh, compose the rewilding triangle. And this is a, a work we need to advance. Finally, I want to end with, um, with um, research, so with, with uh, stressing the importance of promoting research that helps us to identify um, to test the rewilding hypothesis. That is, there are places that are of good condition and where nature will uh, recover by itself. So to the left, uh, you can see here, for example, in green, uh, a lot of uh, available habitats for one single uh, species of megafauna. This is for the brown bear. And many, many, like most of, the, uh, of those available habitats are actually not occupied by bears at present. This is a huge opportunity for natural expansions, of course, also for, for introductions. We have been doing this work, not only for brown bear, we, are, we have been doing this for um, all the large carnivores and large herbivores. And we find similar patterns for all carnivores, so even more available areas for Eurasian lynx, for a wolf, and, uh, and for most of the herbivores as well. And to the right, you see here also some graphs showing uh, the distribution of abandoned uh, land in relation to the distribution of, of grasslands. And uh, what this graph is showing, what is the ecological integrity of abandoned and used grasslands and the ecological integrity of abandoned and uh, used uh, agricultural lands. And uh, the message here is that abandoned land is uh, scores higher in the ecological integrity index than used land. And this is not uh, locally, which is, uh, of course, something one would, would expect. This is referring to the land, entire landscape, big landscapes surrounding those areas, which, uh, again, shows us the big opportunities that there are uh, in uh, abandoned land for restoration. Finally, in terms of policy, um, I would like to deliver this message. So there are like four main aspects that we should consider for an uh, European level perspective of nature restoration. First of all, is that we need to, pursue, to, to improve the ecosystem functions. It's not only about restoring the composition of ecological communities, it's also about being able to restore the ecosystem functions associated to that. 
Second is that we need to uh, ensure science-based assessments with approaches, with monitoring approaches and with prioritization approaches like the one I showed here that are consistent and are similar at big scales and local scales. Third, uh, it is key to improve the coherence and the connectivity of the landscapes and especially with the backbone of the natural resource network. And finally, I didn't show results here about aquatic systems, but similar approaches can be um, used for those aquatic systems. Okay, with this, uh, I want to thank uh, for listening. I want to thank also our project partners, uh, Rewal in Europe, WWF, BirdLife, and the European Environmental Bureau, um, and also the Terra Nova project, uh, the H2020 uh, funded project Terra Nova, where a bunch of PhD students are contributing to this research. Thank you, Nestor. Thank you. This has been an incredible presentation. I find it amazing how you consolidate and manage to get so much information and knowledge in, in 20 minutes. I know there's been years and years of research in these topics, and there's a lot happening right now. So thanks a lot for, for your uh, contribution today. Um, as you were speaking, there were a lot of questions coming in, and our audience continues quite engaged. Uh, so I'm going to go straight to the questions, if that's okay with you. Um, there's one, one question coming from uh, Lyndon, um, and this is the question. Spain is a big country with a problem of empty old farmland. Why aren't there any rewilding projects taking place in Spain at the moment? Well, there are. I mean, um, uh, maybe the, this is a question for you, Raquel, <laughs> on the world in Europe. But uh, there are. Well, first of all, Spain, uh, it's my country. Uh, in Spain, there are big opportunities for, for natural rewilding. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a lot of abandoned land, and I'm, I'm not speaking about land that is being abandoned now, I'm speaking about land that has been abandoned in the last century. So Mediterranean countries, and Spain in particular, have lots of land that have been abandoned, um, and they are there, you know, for, for, for doing this kind of, uh, of projects. Uh, I know that there is um, a branch of rewilding Europe in Spain, uh, rewilding Spain, I think it's uh, recently created, and I know that there is um, one side, well, it's the Coa Bailey, that I think it, it's, uh, it's in the border with Spain, but, but definitely there is this initiative for Rewilding in Spain that, uh, that are already starting to look to some places. For example, in Serrania de Cuenca, I know that they are uh, assessing the potential to uh, establish there one of the Rewilding sites, and that's actually one of the areas that uh, score highest in our ecological integrity indicator, and there is still a lot of potential to improve ecological condition there. Thank you. I, I agree with you. I think there's great potential in Spain, and much is happening, and much more can happen. One other question coming from uh, uh, Ward. Um, these are two interesting concepts, and how do you uh, compare rewilding farmland and food forests? And, and food forests? Food forests. I, I'm not familiar with the concept of food forests. What does it mean exactly? Well, I'm not familiar either, to be honest, but uh, I will assume that this is the, the, the fine line between a rewilded, uh, a farm that has been rewilded, which I assume has natural forest coming back, and where there is still a forest where um, you have uh, food production and a mixing of systems. But I am not familiar with this term either. OK, OK. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess my, my answer will maybe is not uh, so good about that. But I, I want to stress um, one point. Uh, rewilding, in my opinion, uh, is not about you know, reaching a final state of uh, top ecological integrity. And uh, this means there are small actions that one could uh, try to address in, in every landscape. So for example, in, in agricultural areas, and we have a big problem in Europe now because mm. uh, with the intensification and cap policies that are kind of promoting even more the intensification of agricultural areas. In those areas, there is always land available um, for promoting restoration of uh, even small vegetation patches that can increase the connectivity of the landscapes uh, and so on. So I, I consider the wilding like a gradient where one can always push 
like this score, if you want to see it in, in terms of scores, one can always push towards a more natural state, no matter where you are. It can be in a, in a forest or it can be in a natural area. Um, we need to do a lot of work while in natural areas because uh, most natural areas in Europe, I didn't show this slide, I think, but most natural areas in Europe have a relatively low uh, value in our in ecological integrity index. Um, but also there are many opportunities, uh, even in cities, surroundings of cities and agricultural areas and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah, and speaking of, uh, of uh, opportunities, uh, the next question, next question speaks to that um, and also speaks uh, to the video that we watched. Um, can we use GNEP as a model for revitalizing degraded agriculture areas and make them fertile again? Well, GNEP is, is, is a great example. Uh, it's a very particular initiative. Um, there are places for sure where similar uh, projects can be established but this is something that, um, and, and this can be scaled up. This needs to be scaled up. But I think the big opportunities, and, uh, and uh, I want to make this very clear, those are key projects. But there are uh, big opportunities having even a broader uh, perspective of big landscapes uh, where rewilding actions, and particularly with uh, natural restoration, um, can be implemented in, let's say, uh, in a most in a less costly uh, way, and this is uh, addressing to uh, many big landscapes uh, that are intensively managed, like the ones I, were, I was saying before, including forests uh, and so on. But um, where some small actions, so for example, just think about uh, recovering the uh, integrity of traffic processes. So even in managed uh, landscapes like uh, agricultural areas or intensively used forests, we can recover those species. It's, a, it's, a, it's about uh, addressing the recovery of those species as a um, goal by itself. It's, it's not only about preserving the species themselves because they are endangered species. In some cases, they are not. The goal itself is to recover the functional um, value of those species. So even in those areas uh, where we cannot implement like a flagship revolving project, let's say, still there is a lot of potential with, uh, you know, tapping on, on the specific opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Nestor. Uh, the next question uh, changes a little bit uh, what we've been discussing. A lot of the discussion so far today has been about land-based uh, rewilding initiatives and the potential of rewilding uh, on land. But now we're moving to the sea. Um, so what are the opportunities that you see for rewilding the sea? How can you create well, interest, excitement, engagement for an environment that is much less accessible than land areas? Well, that, that's a great question, and I, I don't have the answer. I, I'm not a marine uh, ecologist at all. <laughs> um, so, you know, but the same uh, ecological processes um, that are affecting megafauna on land mm -hmm. are affecting megafauna on seas. Yeah. This is about uh, extractions. This is about non-regulated extractions or, or very softly regulated uh, extractions. This is about not being able to identify uh, in a consistent way uh, to what extent we are having an impact on the local populations. This is about not being able to identify in which spaces and when we should stop temporarily or permanently um, doing those extractions in order to allow um, the local uh, communities to recover and from there to expand um, to degraded areas. This is my general uh, answer. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was a. Uh, I know that it was going to catch you by surprise, but. Uh, Good answer. Um, one last question from our audience, and then uh, we'll move on to the, the next, uh, some, some questions uh, that we also have for you. Uh, this question is from David, and he's asking, why is rewilding not also looking at rewilding urban areas? So in other words, looking at the entire uh, surface of the world. It is, uh, in my opinion, it is. And, um, mm -hmm. and I think it's very important to, th this is a very good question. Um, I think it's very important to realize 
that rewilding can be done everywhere. And in urban areas, of course, you cannot reintroduce, uh, I don't know, brown bear, yeah? But you can do other things. So one of the um, examples that we have been using in our talks and in our publications and so on is the Albald you know, here in the city of Leipzig, where, where I live. Um, the entire dynamics of that forest, which is a forest that cross the city in two parts. So it, it divides the city in two parts. The entire dynamics of that forest has been uh, modified in, in the last centuries uh, through channelizations. And now there are projects that are uh, trying to recover the natural dynamics of, um, of, the, of the river, um, allowing for flows. And that is having an important effect on the plant community composition uh, and so on. So yes, uh, according to, of course, uh, it, um, there are opportunities in urban areas, and uh, and I am totally in with the idea that rewilding needs to, you know, uh, encompass the full range from highly uh, degraded areas, in a sense, like urban areas, to highly protected areas. Great, thank you, thank you, Nestor. Um, I will uh, continue from here. I mean, we've got many questions. We will not be able to answer them all. Uh, but from here, I would like to move to the polling uh, results that we uh, just uh, received. And many of you took the time to vote. And um, so I just want to, to, to share with you those results that you have them on your screen. Uh, basically, what we have here is uh, overwhelming yes, that uh, it is possible to have more um, farmland converted into uh, rewilding and transforming uh, that land into rewilding. Not just net examples of those estates, which is the first uh, answer and the most uh, most uh, voted one. Yes, we can have more NEP, uh, NEP wilding, um, rewilded estates, but also uh, there's a, a very clear yes that uh, we also need far less, uh, in, we need to transform intensive use farmland uh, to, uh, less, to farming that uh, needs less input uh, into the natural, into the farming processes. So, Nessa, what do you think about these results? Oh. I, I would both say uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy that people is uh, is realizing yeah. about this. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. No, it's uh, it's it's clear. Maybe we are a little bit biased because of our audience, <laughs> but yeah. um, it's great to see that uh, uh, we have a lot of young people, and uh, that is that is very interesting to see the the type of results coming up. We have uh, I have a few questions for you now, uh, if that's okay. Um, your presentation was incredible. It showed the potential for, for rewilding throughout the continent. Uh, but you also show that, you know, looking at those maps more, more, in more detail, the areas that are showing more potential are the areas that are less, uh, less uh, uh, populated, um, uh, like abandoned land uh, from agriculture. Um, but the truth is that a lot of the European continent is populated. I mean, I'm here in the Netherlands, you're there in Germany. This is one, two of the most uh, populated uh, countries is in Europe. So the question is, is where do you see a potential for rewilding in, in Northwestern Europe, in places like deltas and areas that have high population densities? Uh, how do you see the potential there? Yeah, uh, absolutely. If Again, if we embrace the idea that the wilding is about, you know, allowing as much as possible. So this idea of the triangle, with uh, where you have um, a red area in the center, which is the the constraint. So it's the current status, highly degraded status, or degraded status to, to some extent. Mm -hmm. And we are able to acknowledge that some of the limitations may be relaxed. Uh, either because uh, there have been changes, societal changes or, or so on, um, but also through, through action. Uh, we need to find those opportunities to, you know, to push the red area towards the limits um, that are set by the, by the conditions. Now, um, yeah, of course, I mean, we, we have a, a landscape in Europe, which is a result of centuries of um, high human development. This is with, uh, what's, what we need to work. And there are some areas in Europe that simply cannot be uh, reconnected to the uh, extent that we would like to, yeah? So that's, um, 
that's, that's a reality. But even in those highly populated areas, there is always natural landscapes in the surroundings. So this is something we, we found in our maps. Uh, when, we, when we were mapping, for example, the uh, ecological integrity around cities in Europe, there are excellent cases, like uh, like I, I was putting the example of, of Ljubljana, but also Helsinki. Well, there are some others. Uh, there are some bad cases, like uh, I was uh, putting the example of Brussels, but even yeah. in the worst areas, there is nature around. So the thing is, what do we do with that nature? And the traditional paradigm in Europe has been manage the nature in the surroundings of cities for making parks uh, that are beautiful for people. And I think that's wrong. I think that is that is maybe uh, that that's not providing ecological benefits. There is big opportunities even in those intensively uh, occupied areas. Uh, to allow uh, more natural nature, if I can, or more natural functioning ecosystems uh, through different kinds of management. And as soon as we realize about that, I think uh, we can do significant changes also in highly populated areas. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That brings me to the next question. That uh, it, it goes back to a central theme of your presentation, which was connectivity. So connectivity in the sense that the more connected the areas are, the larger the, the area that uh, uh, biodiversity and wildlife in particular can move uh, through. And you, you make a point that it is important to have this connectivity. At the same time, uh, we have uh, examples of wolf and uh, uh, golden jackal. They just move. They just move from between Germany and, and now in, in the Netherlands even. And they move through this matrix of, of farmland and urbanized areas and somehow they get around. So the question for me is how important is this connectivity and how important is it to have these large areas that are connected? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good question, uh, Rachel. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely we, we, have, we have learned a lot in the last year. Uh, from kind of the idea in the 80s, 90s, um, where most people thought, you know, wolf needs uh, highly natural areas, so yeah. uh, wood conservation areas, and uh, they are restricted to very specific areas. I mean, it's not only wolf. So look at the Avaria links. So the Avaria links yeah. uh, reintroduction project in, in Spain, they have been recording lynxes. Um, walking hundreds of kilometers, uh, doing all the way from southern Spain to uh, almost north, uh, northwestern Spain and then back, um, or going to, you know, from southern Spain to northern Portugal with, <laughs> uh, they really move, they really move, but still they find a lot of barriers. I, I've been personally uh, worked with links. Um, they are often killed in infrastructures so connectivity um, is about also increasing the permeability of the landscape so that uh, in a mm -hmm. way that the populations are less affected, for example, by or less driven, uh, the population dynamics are less driven by mortality um, in those connecting areas. That's one point. The second point is that if we look at some species, um, you know, connectivity might seem like uh, they are able to move, yeah? So they, they will make their way. Mm -hmm. But this is for some very particular species. There are others that um, are really dependent on on some specific, uh, yeah, um, landscape types to be mm -hmm. able to, to move. And uh, the wilding, we are focusing a lot on, in the wilding on megafauna because for several reasons. First of all, because they are species uh, that provide uh, particularly important ecosystem functions, mm -hmm. but also because those are species that has been that have been particularly affected by human persecution throughout history. Yeah, so those are two key elements why we are focusing on, on megafauna. But the wilding is about recovering natural processes, not only megafauna but also all the fauna, all the flora, and everything behind, and, and how they function and they interact. And uh, for uh, many of other species of small size, um, even one road uh, is enough to separate populations. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Nestor. Um, this has been a super insightful uh, presentation and uh, interaction. 
Um, thank you very much for your time. I'm sure that our audience also uh, enjoyed it uh, and learned a lot in the process. Uh, so, yeah, thanks. Um, thank you, Raquel. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming. So we'll now uh, are heading into a 30 minute break uh, for our lunch break. Um, we will be coming back at uh, one o'clock. But and when we come back, uh, please do come back because we have uh, an incredible movie to show you of what is happening right now uh, in Romania uh, with the recovery and the rewilding of the European bison. This is a movie that has been uh, done recently um, in, in that country, in the Southern Carpathians. And it's going to show you how people are uh, benefiting and how people are interacting in a, in a rewilding, uh, rewilded landscape. Uh, it's super interesting, so do come back. Um, uh, but in the meantime, enjoy your lunch, and I'll see you again at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Mm -hmm.